the Battle of Belgium or Belgian Campaign, often referred to within Belgium as the 18 Days Campaign, formed part of the Greater Battle of France an offensive campaign by Germany during the Second World War. It took place over 18 days in May 1940 and ended with the German occupation of Belgium following the surrender of the Belgian army. On 10 May 1940, Germany invaded Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Belgium under the operational plan Fall Gelb. The Allied armies attempted to hold the German army in Belgium, believing it to be the main German thrust. After the French had fully committed the best of the Allied armies to Belgium between 10 and 12 May, the Germans enacted the second phase of their operation, a breakthrough, or sickle cut, through the Ardennes, and advanced toward the English Channel. The German army reached the Channel after five days, encircling the Allied armies. The Germans gradually reduced the pocket of Allied forces, forcing them back to the sea. The Belgian army surrendered on 28 May 1940, ending the battle. The Battle of Belgium included the first tank battle of the war, the Battle of Hanut. The battle also included the Battle of Fort Ebenemmel, the first strategic airborne operation using paratroopers ever attempted. The German official history stated that in the 18 days of bitter fighting, the Belgian army were tough opponents and spoke of the extraordinary bravery of its soldiers. The Belgian collapse forced the Allied withdrawal from continental Europe. The British Royal Navy subsequently evacuated Belgian ports during Operation Dynamo, allowing the British Army to escape and continue military operations. France reached its own armistice with Germany in June 1940. Belgium was occupied by the Germans until the autumn of 1944, when it was liberated by the Western Allies. Pre-battle plans Belgium's strained alliances The Belgian strategy for a defence against German aggression faced political as well as military problems. In terms of military strategy, the Belgians were unwilling to stake everything on a linear defence of the Belgian-German border, in an extension of the Maginot Line. Such a move would leave the Belgians vulnerable to a German assault in their rear through an attack on the Netherlands. Such a strategy would also rely on the French to move quickly into Belgium and support the garrison there. Politically, the Belgians did not trust the French. Marshal Philippe Petain had suggested a French strike at Germany's Ruhr area using Belgium as a springboard in October 1930 and again in January. 1933, Belgium feared it would be drawn into a war regardless, and sought to avoid that eventuality. The Belgians also feared being drawn into a war as a result of the French-Soviet Pact of May 1935. The Franco-Belgian agreement stipulated Belgium was to mobilise if the Germans did, but what was not clear was whether Belgium would have to mobilise in the event of a German invasion of Poland. The Belgians much preferred an alliance with the United Kingdom. The British had entered the First World War in response to the German violation of Belgian neutrality. The Belgian Channel ports had offered the German Imperial Navy valuable bases, and such an attack would offer the German Kriegsmarine and the Luftwaffe bases to engage in strategic offensive operations against the United Kingdom in the coming conflict but the British government paid little attention to the concerns of the Belgians. The lack of this commitment ensured the Belgian withdrawal from the Western alliance the day before the remilitarization of the Rhineland. The lack of opposition to the remilitarization served to convince the Belgians that France and Britain were unwilling to fight for their own strategic interests, let alone Belgium's. The Belgian general staff was determined to fight for its own interests, alone if necessary. Belgian place in Allied strategy The French were infuriated at King Leopold III's open declaration of neutrality in October 1936. The French army saw its strategic assumptions undermined, it could no longer expect closer cooperation with the Belgians in defending the latter's eastern borders enabling a German attack to be checked well forward of the French border. The French were dependent on how much cooperation they could extract from the Belgians. 
Such a situation deprived the French any prepared defences in Belgium to forestall an attack, a situation which the French had wanted to avoid as it meant engaging the German panzer divisions in a mobile battle. The French considered invading Belgium immediately in response to a German attack on the country. The Belgians, recognizing the danger posed by the Germans, secretly made their own defense policies, troop movement information, communications, fixed defense dispositions, intelligence and air reconnaissance arrangements available to the French military attaché in Brussels. The Allied plan to aid Belgium was the Dial Plan, the cream of the Allied forces, which included the French armored divisions would advance to the Dial River in response to a German invasion. The choice of an established Allied line lay in either reinforcing the Belgians in the east of the country, at the Meuse-Albert Canal line, and holding the Scheldt estuary, thus linking the French defences in the south with the Belgian forces protecting Ghent and Antwerp, seemed to be the soundest defensive strategy. The weakness of the plan was that, politically at least, it abandoned most of eastern Belgium to the Germans. Militarily it would put the Allied rear at right angles to the French frontier defences, while for the British, their communications located at the Bay of Biscay ports, would be parallel to their front. Despite the risk of committing forces to central Belgium in an advance to the Shed or Dial lines, which would be vulnerable to an outflanking move. Maurice Gamelin, the French commander, approved the plan and it remained the Allied strategy upon the outbreak of war. The British, with no army in the field and behind in rearmament, was in no position to challenge French strategy, which had assumed the prominent role of the Western Alliance. Having little ability to oppose the French, the British strategy for military action came in the form of strategic bombing of the Ruhr industry. Belgian military strategy upon the official Belgian withdrawal from the Western Alliance. The Belgians refused to engage in any official staff meetings with the French or British military staff for fear of compromising its neutrality. The Belgians did not regard a German invasion as inevitable and were determined that if an invasion did take place it would be effectively resisted by new fortifications such as Eben Emel. The Belgians had taken measures to reconstruct their defences along the border with the German state upon Adolf Hitler's rise to power in January. 1933, the Belgian government had watched with increasing alarm the German withdrawal from the League of Nations its repudiation of the Treaty of Versailles and its violation of the Locarno Treaties. The government increased expenditure on modernizing the fortifications at Namur and Liege. New lines of defense were established along the maastricht bois le duc Canal, joining the Meuse, Scheldt and the Albert Canal. The protection of the eastern frontier, based mainly on the destruction of a number of roads, was entrusted to new formations. By 1935, the Belgian defences had been completed. Even so, it was felt that the defences were no longer adequate. A significant mobile reserve was needed to guard the rear areas, and as a result it was considered that the protection against a sudden assault by German forces was not sufficient. Significant manpower reserves were also needed, but a bill made for the provision of longer military service and training for the army was rejected by the public on the basis that it would increase Belgium's military commitments as well as the request of the Allies to engage in conflicts far from home. King Leopold III made a speech on 14 October 1936 in front of the Council of Ministers in an attempt to persuade the people that the defences needed strengthening. He outlined three main military points for Belgium's increased rearmament. A German rearmament, following upon the complete remilitarization of Italy and Russia, caused most other states, even those that were deliberately pacifistic, like Switzerland and the Netherlands, to take exceptional precautions. B. There has been such a vast change in the methods of warfare as a result of technical progress, particularly in aviation and mechanization, that the initial operations of armed conflict could now be of such force, speed and magnitude as to be particularly alarming to small countries like Belgium.
c. Our anxieties have been increased by the lightning reoccupation of the Rhineland and the fact that bases for the start of a possible German invasion have been moved near to our frontier. On 24 April 1937, the French and British delivered a public declaration that Belgium's security was paramount to the Western Allies and that they would defend their frontiers accordingly against aggression of any sort. Whether this aggression was directed solely at Belgium, or as a means of obtaining bases from which to wage war against other states, the British and French, under those circumstances, released Belgium from her Locarno obligations to render mutual assistance in the event of German aggression toward Poland, while the British and French maintained their military obligations to Belgium. Militarily, the Belgians considered the Wehrmacht to be stronger than the Allies. Particular the British Army in engaging in overtures to the Allies would result in Belgium becoming a battleground without adequate Allies. The Belgians and French remained confused about what was expected of each other if or when hostilities commenced. The Belgians were determined to hold the border fortifications along the Albert Canal and the Meuse without withdrawing until the French army arrived to support them. Gamelin was not keen on pushing his Dahl plan that far. He was concerned that the Belgians would be driven out of their defences and would retreat to Antwerp, as in 1914. In fact, the Belgian divisions protecting the border were to withdraw and retreat southward to link up with French forces. This information was not given to Gamelin. As far as the Belgians were concerned, the Dahl plan had advantages. Instead of the limited Allied advance to the Scheldt, or meeting the Germans on the Franco-Belgian border, the move to the Dial River would reduce the Allied front in central Belgium by 70 kilometres, freeing more forces for use as a strategic reserve. It was felt it would save more Belgian territory, in particular the eastern industrial regions. It also had the advantage of absorbing Dutch and Belgian army formations. Gamelin was to justify the Dial plan after the defeat using these arguments. On 10 January 1940, in an episode known as the Mechelen Incident, a German army major Helmuth Reinberger crash landed in a Messerschmitt Bf 108 near Mechelen Aan de Maas. Reinberger was carrying the first plans for the German invasion of Western Europe which, as Gamelin had expected, entailed a repeat of the 1914 Schlieffen plan and a German thrust through the Belgium and into France. The Belgians suspected a ruse, but the plans were taken seriously. Belgian intelligence and the military attaché in Cologne correctly suggested the Germans would not commence the invasion with this plan. It suggested that the Germans would try an attack through the Belgian Ardennes and advance to Calais with the aim of encircling the Allied armies in Belgium. The Belgians had correctly predicted the Germans would attempt a Kesselschlacht to destroy its enemies. The Belgians had predicted the exact German plan as offered by Erich von Manstein. The Belgian High Command warned the French and British of their concerns. They feared that the Dial plan would put not just the Belgian strategic position in danger, but also the entire left wing of the Allied front. King Leopold and General Raoul van Overstraaton, the King's aide-de-camp, warned Gamelin and the French army command of their concerns on 8 March and 14 April. They were ignored. Belgian plans for defensive operations The Belgian plan, in the event of German aggression, italics in original, provided for a delaying position along the Albert Canal from Antwerp to Liege and the Meuse from Liege to Namur, which was to be held long enough to allow French and British troops to occupy the line antwerp namur Give. It was anticipated that the forces of the guarantor powers would be in action on the third day of an invasion, withdrawal to the antwerp namur position. The Belgian army was to hold the sector excluding Leuven, but including Antwerp as part of the main Allied defensive position. In an agreement with the British and French armies, the French 7th Army under the command of Henry Giraud was to advance into Belgium past the Shell Testuary in Zeeland if possible, to Breda, in the Netherlands. 
The British Army's British Expeditionary Force or BEF, commanded by General John Vereker, Lord Gort, was to occupy the central position in the Brussels-Ghent Gap supporting the Belgian Army holding the main defensive positions some 20 kilometres east of Brussels. The main defensive position ringing Antwerp would be protected by the Belgians, barely 10 kilometres from the city. The French 7th Army was to reach the Zeeland or Breda, just inside the Dutch border. The French would then be in a position to protect the left flank of the Belgian army forces protecting Antwerp and threaten the German northern flank. Further east, delaying positions were constructed in the immediate tactical zones along the Albert Canal, which joined with the defences of the Meuse west of Maastricht. The line deviated southward and continued to Liege. The maastricht liege gap was heavily protected. Fort Eben Emil guarded the city's northern flank. The tank country lying in the strategic depths of the Belgian forces occupying the city and the axis of advance into the west of the country. Further lines of defence ran southwest, covering the liege namur axis. The Belgian army also had the added benefit of the French First Army, advancing toward Gembalou and Hanut, on the southern flank of the BEF and covering the Samba sector. This covered the gap in the Belgian defences between the main Belgian positions on the Dial Line with Namur to the south. Further south still, the French 9th Army advanced to the Givet non axis on the Meuse River. The French 2nd Army was responsible for the last 100 kilometres of front, covering Sedan, the Lower Meuse, the Belgian-Luxembourg border and the northern flank of the Maginot Line. German operational plans The German plan of attack required that Army Group B would advance and draw in the Allied 1st Army Group into Central, Belgium, while Army Group A conducted the surprise assault through the Ardennes. Belgium was to act as a secondary front with regard to importance. Army Group B was given only limited numbers of armoured and mobile units while the vast majority of the Army Group comprised infantry divisions. After the English Channel was reached, all Panzer Division units and most motorised infantry were removed from Army Group B and given to Army Group A, to strengthen the German lines of communication and to prevent an Allied breakout. Such a plan would still fail if sufficient ground could not be taken quickly in Belgium to squeeze the Allies against two fronts. Preventing this from happening were the defences of Fort Eben Emmel and the Albert Canal. The three bridges over the canal were the key to allowing Army Group B a high operational tempo. The bridges at Veldwezelt, Vroenhoven and Cannes in Belgium, and Maastricht on the Dutch border were the target. Failure to capture the bridges would leave Reichenau's German 6th Army, the southernmost army of Group B, trapped in the Maastricht-Albert Canal enclave and subjected to the fire of Eben Emmel. The fort had to be captured or destroyed. Adolf Hitler summoned Lieutenant General Kurt Student of the 7th Flieger Division to discuss the assault. It was first suggested that a conventional parachute drop be made by airborne forces to seize and destroy the fort's guns before the land units approached. Such a suggestion was rejected as the Junkers Ju-52 transports were too slow and were likely to be vulnerable to Dutch and Belgian anti-aircraft guns. Other factors for its refusal were the weather conditions, which might blow the paratroopers away from the fort and disperse them too widely. A seven-second drop from a Ju-52 at minimum operational height led to a dispersion over 300 meters alone. Hitler had noticed one potential flaw in the defenses. The roofs were flat and unprotected, he demanded to know if a glider, such as the DFS-230, could land on them. Student replied that it could be done, but only by 12 aircraft and in daylight, this would deliver 80 to 90 paratroopers onto the target. Hitler then revealed the tactical weapon that would make this strategic operation work. Introducing the Holad Ungwaffe, a 50 kg explosive weapon which would destroy the Belgian gun emplacements. It was this tactical unit that would spearhead the first strategic airborne operation in history.